and hello once more ladies and gentlemen boys and girls welcome to episode 51 of a druid's dozen yep my name's john i'm known in certain circles as the rock druid and uh, basically this is just me killing a bit of time on a saturday afternoon dragging out some albums from my record collection and waving them in front of the camera um i've been record collecting for many years i'm also a radio dj do a couple of radio shows uh links to which are going to be down there and over there gotta do the finger dance for the missus and um yeah so dozen albums six on out on uh, vinyl six on cd and uh, we'll pass straight in and we'll start this week with a bit of a classic here we go this is borrowed time by diamond head oh living on borrowed time by diamond head sorry borrowed times the track living on borrowed times the album there's the front there's the back now this isn't an original this isn't the first pressing this is a later edition the first pressing half i believe had a gatefold um mine's not got a gatefold mine's just a standard sleeve no it does say borrowed time on there oh well don't know what the mix up there is but anyway um diamond heads second four length album after uh the first one which was either diamond head white album lightning for the nations it's had several uh names under its various incarnations um not waving that one around today got this one out this is their second album from uh 1982 i believe 82 yeah um their first last the first of their two uh um mca record they uh mca albums yeah falling over me worms today never mind <coughs> their first their two mca albums and um the one that features some iconic rodney matthews artwork um rodney matthews one of my favorite um uh, sort of like graphic artists graphic designers album cover dudes and um i had the great privilege of meeting having a copy with him at a festival a few years ago really nice geezer but anyway um yep there's the front inspired by the track uh, borrowed time which is um kind of got a kind of loose kind of uh, elric um kind of vibe to it elric of course being one of michael moorcock's most famous characters and uh, if i remember rightly if i remember my moorcock novels correctly uh, look if you look at the back if it folded out it's the bit from um oh god it's the bit where elric tries to get to tunnel on the city of eternal peace and ends up being dragged to another score the city of hell and beggars instead but anyway um and there's elric with stormbringer cursing his fist at tunnel in the background anyway that's just the album cover um the music on this is a first rate now diamond head came out of stour bridge um did their first album lightning for the nations had a few kind of sort of culty singles got signed up did this one as their first kind of major label release and it's a classic it's diamond head are one of these bands you know yes they can be kind of flat out headbang heavy um well they were on the first album but they were a band that were always kind of experimenting with sound they always um kind of had something different up their sleeve and their first three albums if you listen to them like back to back are quite different between each album this one um is quite a overall quite a slow album not it's not sabbathy doom slow but it's very kind of epic and ponderous in its scope um it's kind of uh magnificently kind of uh huge sound on this record um 
yeah, you've got uh, some superb performances. The opposite, uh, yeah, Brian Tatler um, does the guitar and vocals. Uh, Sean Harris lead vocals and a few other bits and pieces with the Colin Kimberley and Duncan Scott rhythm section. Um, Make you for this huge, great, big, big sounding record. Uh, the cuts on here are got some of the cuts on here are legendary. You got opening up with the in the heat of the night. Um, which was the single of this album it was quite a substantial well it, it charted in the UK put it that way from heaven to hell call me lightning to the nations and then the b-side of borrowed time which is the title track I'm living on borrowed time absolutely excellent cut uh, a rather kind of bluesy number don't you ever leave me um, which is a bit of a which is a bit of a pleasant surprise when you listen to the album all the way through, and um, then you've got "Am I Evil," a re-recorded version uh, of a cut that was on their first album, and an absolutely storming version of it um, from a uh, from the opening riff, which sounds like uh, something that was written by Gustav Holst, the uh, classical composer, to that epic riff um yeah i know a few people have tried to cover it including metallica who did a passable version i'll be honest but you know of all the versions of um am i evil my favorite is the one on this album just a great record overall um one that every dessert discerning metalhead should have in their collection or at least be aware of um just a work of genius from the album cover to the music and beyond. Yeah. Uh, borrowed Time, Diamond Head, 1982. Okay, next up, go to our first CD of the day. And here we'll have this one. It's Raw by the Dirty Lions. From only a few years ago, this one, if I remember rightly. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll have a look in a minute. But there's the front. There is the back. Let me pop, pop this out. Just minimalist information. Just the who who produced it which is a band did and who plays on it there now no date on this whatsoever um but i've only had this a couple of years and, it, and i've got it well it was said to be pre-release so um oh yeah just in case you're interested there is the disc so 2016 2017 I'm no doubt if there's anyone out there that knows this band, they might they can correct me. Um, but anyway, Dirty Lions, if I remember rightly, based around London, and uh, basically it's the uh, formed by Gary Bowler. Now Gary Bowler, drummer from the legendary Mornblade. A couple of bands that have surfaced over the last few years, another one being Magpie, um, which featuring ex Mornblade members. Mornblade, I've dealt with a few, quite a few times on this channel. One of my also favourite kind of underground cult bands, kind of heavy space rock kind of stuff. Dirty Lions are a bit different. These are a kind of old school blues rock band. Um, fantastic female uh, vocals from a girl called uh, Michelle Jimenez Alder. Um, twin guitars from Ken Day and Mark Wright. A guy called Lowell Dazil on bass and the aforementioned Gary Bowler from uh, Mornblade on drums. Um, exploring a kind of blues, blues rock vein kind of thing. Um, if you can imagine, I suppose, a female fronted white snake shorn of their keyboards and roughened up a bit, kind of where they, that's what they remind me of. But it's, you know, um, also maybe in the vein of some of the current crop of. Uh, 
uh, Belgium uh, blues rock acts, you know, bands like the Travelling Blues Kings and the Blue Bones um, kind of vibe to them. Just a very, very good album. Um, I, there's a couple of interesting tracks in here where they kind of deviate in a way from the uh, kind of blues rock stuff. There's a, band, there's a track called Scarabic, which is a got a bit of a scar vibe to it. There's, um, uh, you know, but yeah, you know, the rest of it's the whole album is pretty good. Um, highlights include Roller Coaster, Shoot Me Down, Tiger, and Bad Day. Um, yeah, uh, as far as I'm aware, Dirty Lions still very active. Well, they will be once lockdown's over. And um, yeah, you know, I don't. And I heard from Gary that they were talking about a follow-up album to this, but whether that fell foul to lockdown. I don't know, but I do know that this is a damn fine album, um, w quite obscure, but well worth a dig out, and uh, you can probably get it online, someone like Bandcamp will have it, or something like that, but, um, or just check check out the Dirty Lines at their website, they've got a website address here on, on here, no they haven't, but anyway, give the Dirty Lines a Google, and you might be able to get your, uh, get Polina a copy of this for yourself. Anyway, Raw by Dirty Lions from, I'll say 2017, but I may be wrong. But, yeah, pretty good. Okay, next up, we're going to have a bit of pompous US prog. And it's this. Star Castle. There's the front. This is uh, Citadel from 1977. There's the front. There's the back. Don't think there's any inner sleeves or anything in here. No. But I'll whip this out and I'll show you the disc anyway. There we go. CBS, Epic Records, Sony Division, uh, yellow vinyl, orange vinyl thing. Yellow. So I'm having trouble with me worms today. But anyway, <coughs> Star Castle, an American, um, now, I want to say prog rock, because it's not, I mean, you think of prog rock from a European perspective, and you immediately think of your Genesis's, your King Crimson's, Van der Graaff Generator, maybe Basalt Marillion and Palace, etc. Um, you play this album. I've got a couple of a couple of other albums by Star Castle. I did four, of which I think I've got three in the racks. Um, yeah, these guys are a fair way away from sounding anything like any of the aforementioned bands. Um, although they are quite akin with bands like Angel, um, Saga, Kansas, Styx. Um, yeah, you know, that kind of ilk. Uh, you know, it's kind of what, what I really will call pomp rock. And you know, this, they ain't bad. I'll give, them, I'll, I'll give them that. They're not too bad. This album is their second album, which recorded in London. Um, I'm sorry, Oxfordshire, sorry. Uh, um, yeah, in, uh, between 1976 and 1977. Um, Apparently, according to what I've read, a uh, an attempt to try and capture a more European sound because they thought they were kind of more of a European influenced band than the States. And I don't know. There's something that I find a bit lacking about all the Star Castles albums. Uh, Terry Luthrell, who. Uh, was he the bloke with the original R.O. Speedwagon vocalist? I think he might have been. Um, hasn't really got the voice for it. He sounds a bit weak. Um, you know, with prog rock, you need a distinctive vocalist. You need someone like a fish that's kind of got all the power and bluster. You need a John Anderson that's got a... Uh, even though I'm not a big John Anderson fan, with but got that range. You need someone like that. What's his name from Van der Graaff Generator with this kind of dripping gothic menace? This guy has got a vocal that 
more lends itself to rock and roll than prog rock and it just doesn't really gel unfortunately and the rest of the band it's kind of like i said very american even though this was recorded in england with a british producer to try, so try and get a british sound it's very kind of um still american sounding um you know the blander end of prog um it's a shame because there are there is a lot of talent on show here uh old, old terry lothrell's got a great got a good voice just it's not really suited to this kind of music um yeah i've got a bit uh uh herb shield shield is the uh, keyboard player who's probably the you know the highlight of the playing style for this album you know the guitarists are, are okay they're competent but you know i think they could have done better um you know they somewhat if they want to make be a prog rock band they should have locked themselves in the room with a stack of genesis albums just to learn out how it's done but um yeah the result is a little bit kind of uh disappointing and i found that with all the star cast albums i've got you know i've got a couple of others and you know they don't really satisfy me maybe it's just me hey if i'm wrong and setting star cast will satisfy you in the comments down there go on you know say look you know star cast are great and i don't get them which i'll hand on heart i mean i don't but anyway um yeah i still think the best part of this album is the uh, brothers hilda brand cover you kind of a nice bit of kind of science fiction spacey kind of stuff but uh i didn't show you the back did i well there is the back of the band themselves there we go and there's nothing on the inner sleeve here but anyway um yeah Citadel by star castle 1977 interesting but um not earth shattering okay next up another cd Here we go. This is these Lifeless Planes mini album by Impaled Existence. There's the front. There is the back. There is the disc. There's the gatefold with the information behind the disc and the band photo and that sort of thing. And then this one has a press release. Two thousand and eleven this came out. There's the press release, should you want to pause and read it? Now, these lovely people from, uh, uh, is it uh, Screamlight? Is it Screamlight or Scream Aloud? Scream Aloud Media, unfortunately, have this habit of sticking their promo copies right across the artwork at the front. But, um, you know, shame, but because it is quite, I do quite like some of this doom uh, death metal artwork. But, uh, yeah unfortunately it does mean that you can't see it clearly but anyway empowered existence they're a five-piece death metal band came out of real in north wales um not normally the kind of place you associate with extreme metal but you know real's kind of overall as a town that's punched been punching above its weight over the years uh bringing us bands like the alarm and um i think the other uh, no, just gone. There's another band I've been playing on the radio a fair bit coming through, which are really good at a real. But anyway, um, Empowered Existence formed around about uh, mid 2000s and uh, did a couple of EPs, a couple of albums, and then called it quits in about 2014, 2015. Um, yeah, uh, taking their cue from the likes of. Um, uh you know called, uh, between the buried and me maybe um let's have a quick look 
You know what I say about themselves, haven't you? I'm trying to drag memories out of the old grey noggin and I'll let myself down. Yeah, Whitechapel, um, Vale of Mayer, etc. If you're into bands like that, these will be right up your street. Did quite well for themselves. They went on the road with the likes of Exodus and Evil and a few other bands uh, around about the time this album came out. And, um, yeah, I caught them supporting Exodus in Bristol. Um, very, very impressive. Very, very good set. Only did about 25 minutes, but very entertaining 25 minutes. But, um, yeah, but then, the great, like I said, after this, there was one other album, I think, and then they kind of vanished. But they left behind some good uh, good stuff, including this. Um, tracks on here, uh, there's a little intro piece, and then there's uh, three main, four main tracks. Uh, Through Stinging Eyes and Worthy of Remain, the closing two cuts of my opinion, the highlights. Although, just for completion, Fictions Within the Mind and If Errors Were True. Um, also, a worthy moshable headbang should that be your bag um yeah not much else to say about this but uh you should still be able to find copies knocking around so um if a kind of quirky underground british death metal is your thing uh lee's lifeless planes by empowered existence may be something you want to have a look at okay quick change of gear now as we go for a bit of this Yeah, carved in, in sand by the mission. There's the front. There is the back, and I think this is 1990. Yeah, 1990, this one. Pop this out. Just some nice artwork on there. And then um, some quite hard to read kind of stream of consciousness album credits and band pictures. And just for completion's sake, there's a disc with the label. Now, um, just in case you don't know, um, I think most of you should, but just in case you don't, Mission were a uh, British... I think they're still are, they're still going. British kind of goth rock band. Um, formed when uh, Wayne Hussey and Michael Eldritch, both of which were in the Sister Mercy at the time, had a massive bust up. Apparently Michael Eldritch is a bit one of these Dave Brock characters. He can be a bit awkward to work with. And uh, he basically led to the a lot of the members of Sister Mercy quitting. Um, the surviving members called themselves the sisters very briefly and did a couple of singles and then the inevitable Michael Eldritch court case hit them and they became the mission. Did a string of albums of which, for my shame, this is the only one I possess in physical format. I do have a few other singles, but band that I never really got around to collecting because, um, you know, I had a long-term relationship with a nice goth chick at one time. And she had all the Mission albums, so I didn't really need to get them. I just borrowed hers. And then when we broke up a good few years ago, <laughs> yeah, uh, I lost access to the Mission albums. So, yeah, I have got a few I've got a few of them digitally now, but uh, this is the only one I possess in physical format. Shame, because I do like the Mission. Um, yeah, hand on heart, I do prefer Sisters of Mercy when it comes to this kind of goth. But the Mission are still damn fine. So this album uh, is their third, I think. It came a part of a double set because there's a, a Carved in Sand and then there's a follow-up to this which came out within a couple of months called Grains of Sand. And apparently they were from the uh, same recording sessions and uh, yeah, they just decided to, rather than do a double album, they decided to split the release. Um, status quo did something similar with uh, just supposing never too late in the early 80s but anyway um i do like this album my favorite car on here has to be one of my favorite mission cuts butterfly on a wheel superb spine tingling bit of kind of goth rock darkness other highlights uh paradise will shine like the moon 
um, a superb wine hussy guitar work on it. Um, Hungry as the Hunter, Deliverance, Grapes of Wrath, just a great bit of goth rock. Um, very enjoyable, very, very listenable. All the early mission stuff is pretty damn fine. And um, although I've got to admit, hand on heart, I do prefer the children album to this, you know, I ain't gonna kick this one out of bed. Yeah. Um, 1990 carved in sand by the mission if you like your goth this should be in your collection okay next up my latest addition to my collection I only brought this two days ago charity shop find yeah this is uh, borders and boundaries by less than Jake there's the front there's the back. I have to open this carefully because the jewel case is a bit battered. There is the disc. There's what's behind the disc. Pop this out. There's the back of the booklet. Lyrics. Photies. more lyrics and credits now less than Jake uh, these these are kind of adding to my slowly growing kind of pop punk collection as I, as I say every time one of the sort of anything pop punky comes out <coughs> on these vids um, a genre that for many years passed me by and then I had a couple of mates that were listening to it and that but um, then when I started doing the radio shows, you know, on BCFM especially, I became um, exposed to more of it and, you know, started to get a bit of a liking. Yeah, um, now Lesson Jake out of Gainesville in Florida. And um, what marks these apart from uh, a lot of their contemporaries, you know, your Blink 182s, your Chemical Romances, your Green Days, etc., is these guys have a horn section um, there's a couple of trombones on here with guest saxophone and trumpet um, they tour with a horn section and, they, and, the, and the two trombonists and I think one that they've got a sax player as well joins them occasionally are actually part of the band they're not session musicians they are band, band members and they've also got an interest in sort of Latino punk and ska punk coming from Florida with a big uh, Cuban um, uh, population a Puerto Rican population that's understandable and um, it kind of marks them as something a little bit different a little bit maybe more interesting than a lot of your standard kind of uh, you know pop punkers um, a quick mention of the name less than Jake apparently um, I've been told that when these guys started out and they will get into that point you know when you're going from kind of amateur to pro by semi-pro um, they were a little bit short of money and uh, you know kind of um, they had a small dog apparently Jack Russell and the dog get better than the band did so the, the term less than Jake was taken because the Jake they had less than Jake the Jack Russell but anyway um, coming back to this album this is great I hadn't heard this one before I've got a few bits and pieces mainly small singles by uh, less than Jake but I picked this up charity shop find 50p um, local homeless shelter uh, fundraising thing and um, I just played this I've been playing this quite a lot of quite a lot over the last couple of days it's great um, maybe not as I've been told it's maybe a bit less scary than some of their other bands some of their other albums but um, hey I don't care cuts on here hell looks a lot like LA um, which apparently was one of their singles. Uh, Gainesville Rock City. Malt liquor tastes better when you've got problems. Peter Jackson's Getting Married. The Big Picture. Keyhole. Suburban Myth. Every track on here is a fantastic piece of up-tempo, angsty kind of, maybe slightly emo fueled, but scar-powered party number. Um, I love it. I really do love it. 
Um, maybe I've just found myself a new favourite pop punk band. Um, it's the only full length album I've got by them, but uh, having heard this, I intend to um, rectify that situation ASAP. Band is still going, apparently, they've got about six or seven albums out, of which this is the third, I think, or fourth. Um, again, tell me in the comments. But, uh, yeah. This one came out in the year 2000. Less than Jake. Um, borders, and uh, borders and Boundaries. Absolutely storming. Seriously, storming. Give it a listen. Okay, we're going to keep in that kind of pop-punk vein. But we're going to come at it from a very different angle. Different side of the Atlantic. This is Escape Elliot, and uh, everything here is make believe. And this lot up in Belgium. There's the front. There is the back. I do like the artwork on this one. It makes for a lovely fold out kind of thing. And there's the inside. There is the disc. I think this is 2011, although my it's. Or maybe 2014. I don't know. They, they never think about us old blokes with fading eyesight and glasses when they print CD labels these days, do they? Come on, come on, out you come. There we go. Here's the here, and here's a rather nice booklet. Um, some nice lyrics. Band pictures in here. No band pictures though. But anyway, it's lyrics and credits, a bit of artwork mainly. Now, as I said, this lot are from Belgium. I believe they're from Genk. I may be wrong. And, um. Oh, 2019. Sorry, I was reading on the back. This is only two years old. Sorry, um. My mistake. I was looking at the tiny writing. It's actually in fairly big letters there. Anyway, Engineer Records. This is out on. And, um... Yeah. A Belgium kind of pop punk. Similar kind of make less than Jake. They have... These guys too have a bit of a scar influence. Although... They haven't got the horn section. Um... Although they've got a bit of the old kind of offbeat going. Um... Bit alt rock as well. They're not quite as in your face kind of emo fueled angsty punk as some of the American pop punkers. Um, more in the line of kind of European, no, European pop punk stuff, bands like Vivian, from Switzerland, etc. In that kind of vein. But overall, just a very, very, again, another very enjoyable record. Um, Living, Breathing, Doll is probably my favourite cut on here. But there's uh, Truth Seeker, which is a bit of a up tempo rocker um marina ballerina sea foam ice turn white hey lorelei 12 tracks on here each one's a bit of a um well worth a listen um good band deserve to be better known in the uk than they are although i can imagine that in belgium these guys have got a fair cult following because they deserve to um can't tell you that much else about them uh, but I do know that um, band is still very much together, still very much going. And, uh, you know, because I was looking on their website the other day and they were hoping that when Belgium comes out of lockdown, they're going to be back on the road again. So, uh, you know, never know. Hopefully we might see them in England. I'll do so because I would like to see these guys live to see if they can deliver on stage what they do on the record. But, yeah, worth a check out if you like that kind, if you like something a bit quirky. Um, 
everything here is make believe by uh, Escape Elliot 2019. Okay, more vinyl. And we have this one. This is ASAP, which stands for Adrian Smith and Project, silver and gold, 1989. There is the front. There is the back with Adrian Smith. Joined by uh, Andy Barnett, Dave Corwell, um, uh, Robin Clayton, Richard Young thing on keyboards, and the legendary Zach Starkey on uh, Son of Ringo on drums. There's the gatefold. whip this out there's the disc there EMI records now ASAP Adrian Smith and Projects uh, of course formed by Iron Maiden suicide uh, Bane took the plunge and decided to jump off the sofa there you go mate Put your back up there. I leave his binoculars off. Anyway, um, yeah, uh, 1988, 89, Adrian Smith stepped down from Iron Maiden, replaced by Yannick Gares, and uh, uh, recorded this solo album. Um, came as a bit of a shock when this came out because you know most people are thinking of Adrian Smith Maiden guitarist you're gonna have Maiden Mark II far from it this album owes more to bands like Dare um, maybe FM um, it's a very slick kind of uh, hard rock definitely hard rock and it can and it definitely rocks out in places but it's a big kind of keyboard stadium rock sound on it um, quite interesting um you know <clears throat> and overall i think it works because you've got some per the personnel or playing on this are first rate musicians and you know they're kind of doing so yeah and, and mr smith is doing something different whilst you know retaining his kind of rock and roll roots as they say now um there's cuts on here, there's it's silver and gold, and down the wire, I think, were the two singles off this album. Um, but overall, the rest of the album's pretty good, misunderstood. Favourite card on here is probably going to be Wishing Your Life Away. Um, a lovely piece of uh, guitar work from Mr. Smith on here, interplaying with some really cool, really cool keyboards from uh, uh, Richard Young. Um, just a pretty good album. It's a shame this is the only thing they ever released. Um, after this, the, the Adrian Smith kind of transmorphed uh, the projects into a band called uh, The Untouchables, um, which are a little bit more heavy Maiden-esque kind of thing. And um, they recorded an album that I'm not sure if it ever got actually got released. Although I, I actually saw them live at the... Um, beer cutter in Bristol and if you uh, see the video of one of the singles I did um, again not released and you look the video is up on YouTube you can see me and my mate Paddy bopping around in the front row but uh, yeah but overall um, yeah I think Adrian Smith is a bit of an underrated guitarist and definitely an underrated songwriter I mean most of my favorite Maiden tracks were Adrian Smith penned and um, I think this shows him as a both guitarist and a songwriter uh, to maximum effect. Yeah, 1989, Adrian Smith and Project, Silver and Gold. Pretty good. Okay, next up. Mm. I've been avoiding dragging this one out, but in the end, I have to. Onward by Hawkwind. 
Oh, only again, this is only a couple of years ago. Oh, this is 2012, I think, something like that. Anyway, there we are, onward by Hawkwind. There's the front. There's the back. Pop him open. Merch card. Double disc. There's CD2. There's CD1. Artwork behind the disc. Slide this out. Artwork and lyrics. Pictures. Hawkwind Live. Yeah, um, twin uh, disc thing, you've got a, uh, I think it's a live in a studio, a double live disc, a double studio disc, I can't remember. Um, I don't play this album very often, because overall it doesn't really do anything for me. One of the saddest things about my musical fan career is, it's my opinion, the demise of Hawkwind. Um, they were a band that, in the sort of like when I first started listening to you know rock and that in the late seventies, right through the eighties, Hawkwind were one of my all-time favourite bands. I will crawl over broken broken glass to see Hawkwind, and I, well, I haven't crawled over it. I've walked over broken glass and cut my foot to go to a Hawkwind gig. But um, <clears throat> you know. Uh, then, sort of like late eighties, they did an album called uh, Space Bandits, which I thought was a little bit off par. Then they went all new rave, and did a couple of albums that I really dislike. Um, you know, stuff that should be listened to by pilled up idiots in fields rather than uh, sort of discerning dope smoking hippies. It just left me cold. And then. Um, yeah, they did manage to put it back a bit with albums like Love in Space and the Ron Tree period. Uh, but since then, um, I've heard most of the most of the Hawkwind albums, and none of them really do anything to impress me. I'm gutted saying this, and I don't like as a Hawkwind fan, and someone that loves Hawkwind, you know, I just find them bad, and I'm not and a band I consciously avoid seeing live these days, because, you know, I I, I, I saw out I saw them on tours like the Chronicle of the Black Soul, the Earth Ritual tour, and you know a couple of others back in the eighties, and they were always mind blowing, and then watching what they do on stage these days, yeah, the music's okay. You know, they haven't, they've no longer got a Hugh Lloyd Langton or a Nick Turner to kind of give it a bit of a cutting edge or a Robert Calvert, um, especially since Mr. Dibbs left. And, um, you know, I just find them dull live. You know, I mean, last time I saw them, which I vowed will be the last time I ever see Hawkwind, was a couple of years ago at the studio in Bristol. And it's the only time I've ever wandered out halfway through a Hawkwind gig for a fag. Yeah, because they just didn't, they just weren't hitting my bill. But anyway, um, this album, it's okay. The first side, uh, you've got um, yeah, a couple of highlights. But again, they, they, another thing that annoys me about Hawkwind is they're constantly re-recording old tracks. On here, you've got uh, re-recordings of Death Trap, Greenfin Demon, and Aerospace Age Inferno. Um, why? 
Are you, is Dave Brock running out of ideas that he has to kind of half inch Robert Calvert songs to re record to maintain the copyright? I think so. But, um, you know, but to uh, someone that, you know, what these re recorded versions, they've never got the fire of the original. And I think it's just a pointless waste of either a pointless waste of time or a cynical exercise in money making, which to me goes against everything Hawking ever stood for. Um, overall, this isn't that bad. I mean, you've got cuts on here that like System Check, the Southern Cross, Electric Tears, um, Computer Cowards, uh, Trans Air Trucking. They're all passable, but. You know, if, if you compare them to sort of like classic albums, like I did the Hawk Lords out, the Hawk Lords 25 years the other week on there, compare it to that, compare it to albums, even albums like uh, Sonic Attack, they don't really measure up. Yeah. It's, it hurts me to say this, but um, Hawkwind's onwards. It's in the collection because it's Hawkwind, and not because I really like it. As I said, I keep saying, you don't believe how much that hurts me to say that. But anyway, if you agree, to, if you want a good griffer, point out why I'm wrong. Comments, please. Yeah. Okay, next up, completely change your gear. Here we go. This is the distance, Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band. There's the front. There's the back. It says there, manufacturer's property, not for sale. And I don't think there's anything on the inner sleeve in there, no. <clears throat> That's because this is one of a large batch of records I brought a good few years ago down in Torquay when Devon Air, the low Torquay's local uh, independent radio station, were obviously clearing out their record library. And I picked up a fair number of albums uh, in, on a market stall in Torquay, all bearing that kind of uh, property of Devon Air and the catalogue number at the top. <coughs> now, I've got to admit, I've got a big soft spot for Bob Seger when it comes to blue collar rock from the US. Um, you know, yeah, okay, I, I'm not really a Bon Jovi fan. I, Bruce Springsteen, I can take or leave. Bob Seger, on the other hand, I can love. Um, old uh, Detroit's home uh, finest is one of the finest, in my opinion. He manages to get that kind of working class blue collar rock sound, keeping it very, very rock and roll, up tempo and fun. Um, this album, uh, probably not one of his best, funny enough, but came out in 1982. This just happened to be the one that my hand brushed against as I was going, th going through the racks the other day. And I dragged it out, gave it a listen, and uh, yeah, but it's not bad. Not this isn't a classic Bob Seger by any by any shot, but. It does contain the track Making Thunderbirds, which is a belting song, along with uh, House Behind the House, Roll Me Away, Little Victories, etc. Um, it goes between kind of, you know, rock and roll to make motor cars too, to uh, kind of some quite plaintive kind of um, heartfelt, not exactly ballads, but heartfelt songs. You know, I don't think real Bob Seger really deals in ballads that much. He just, if a song needs to be slow, he sings it slow and soft. If it needs to rock and roll, he'll sing it rock and roll. Mark of a uh, talented musician, in my opinion. But yeah, um, I like this album. I like this album lots. Um, there are other Bob Seger albums like Fire Lake, which I think are far better. But this is still better than a kick in the head. Yeah, Bob Seger and Silver Bullet Band. Uh, the Distance, 1982. Pretty good. Okay, our final CD, and we're going prog rock again. I brought uh, one, I one of the uh, I think Garlands, I think, of, by, by the Band of Rain I talked about a few episodes ago. Another Band of Rain album. One that I dragged out because I just fancied hearing it again and played it, and I thought I'd talk about it today. Yeah, this is Arts and Allurements from 2007. And, um, yeah. I haven't got a complete set of uh, Band of Rain albums. I've got about two or three. Uh, three, I think I've got. And out of the three that I've got, this is my favourite. This is the one that I really like. Yeah. Um, 
just a great album anyway there's the front and BC records there's the back pop this open there's the disc oh yeah behind the disc there's a lovely English landscape whoops I want to get it open there we go Oh, a business card from Chris Gill, the guitarist. I forgot that was in there. And again, open this up. There's not much on the in the gate pole there. Just that. Now, um, Band of Rain focused around Chris Gill, guitarist, keyboard player. Um, And on this, the band is actually officially a three-piece where Chris Gill is joined by drummer Billy Fleming and a vocalist Sharon Leslie with a guest from a guy called uh, uh, Jason Hidge on guitar and uh, Miles Lavis, uh, Jason Hidge on guest guitar and Jason Hidge on bass. Um, nice, slick, fairly contemporary prog rock. Um, I can be a bit down on a lot of modern prog. Um, a lot of it just sounds a bit too generic, away with the fairies. Band of Rain managed to raise above that. They, along with bands like Oceanfield, Band of Rain has always been a band that kind of managed to keep it interesting and relevant, rather than recycling the same old, same old hash, you know, um, that a lot of bands do. Arena. <clears throat> but anyway, um... <coughs> Damn, just a good record. Um, it's not going to win any prizes. It's not going to uh, change the world. But as far as something to just kind of lay back and listen to of a of a dark night, then got a nice quiet evening in with a bed and a good book. This is a good. This is good background music to kind of chill out to. Uh, highlights on here is well, my personal highlight's got to be the epic cut. Uh, movements, uh, sorry, monuments, sorry. Um, but then you got other stuff like the stars beneath the sea, the vampire, uh, title track, arts and allurement, all really sweet. Um, what's the girl's name again? Yeah, Sharon Leslie. I don't know anything else about her, but I do know she's got a cracking voice. It's a real voice. It's not a kind of overly false or strained. It's a uh, nice kind of honest kind of uh, sweet voice Chris Gill is a superb guitarist and a damn fine keyboard player writes some pretty good tracks as well um, so overall I like um, band broke up not long after this came out but have recently reformed again and there is more products in the either out or in the pipeline I don't know I haven't actually checked in with Band of Rain for a while to find out what their current state, state, uh, release status is but um, I'll do so as soon as I finish filming yeah, Arts and Allurement by Band of Rain from 2007 ok, leads to talk about a bit of this and the hell why not Budgie Power Supply 1981 1980 sorry there's the front there is the back <coughs> oh yes budgie power supply album the first of what i like to call their metal their metal album this is probably the heaviest thing budgie have ever done to be honest with you um yeah uh this is where budgie kind of embraced the new wave of british heavy metal full on and um yeah, and while they were doing it, told a lot of the told a lot of the younger up and coming bands exactly how metal should be played. Uh, this is just a great album. I love Budgie anyway. Um, you know, even some of their albums like Impeccable, which isn't one of my it's probably my least favourite Budgie album, I can still find very enjoyable. 
but this along with maybe bandolier and never turn your back on a friend and squall uh, my opinion the peaks of their career they really do better than these albums and that's not taking anything away from albums like night flight but anyway um uh, falling on the heels of uh, the uh, It's Swallowed Not Induced Vomiting EP, which I look upon as budgy kind of testing a new sound, and um, again, one I'll deal with on an earlier show, uh, earlier edition of this, was, which was, as I say, budgy experiment with a new sound. Could budgy get away with being a full blown metal band? The answer came through that EP, yes, they could. And I, I put in evidence as Panzer Division destroyed from that EP. Um, and then followed up with this about six months later. Ooh, what a record, what a record. From the opening cut, Forearm Smash has got the lyric, I'll hit you in the face just like a forearm smash. And that is what this does. It's got this riff that just pummels. Um, new, uh, new guitarist John Thomas uh, got a very interesting kind of almost distinct sound of well, a style of playing. Um, little kind of arpeggios and licks that he kind of repeats and moves up and down the fretboard it's not it's not clever it's not complicated but it's damn effective and um by this time you've got your burke shetty steve williams uh rhythm section are you know they've been together five six years by this point they know what each other's doing it is tight as hell burke shelley maybe not everyone's cup of tea in vote as, as a vocalist but i do like his kind of um Almost like a punk uh, Geddy Lee kind of approach to it. Anyway, if Forearm Smash isn't hasn't pummeled you into submission, the next two tracks, Hell Bandler and Heavy Revolution, um, coming with a couple of body blows and a drop kick, uh, which you know should by this point have you leaning against the wall with your ears bleeding, screaming for more. Slows down a bit with a track called Gunslinger at the end of the in the side one. Um, then, uh, you know, which is you know, kind of a nice kind of cowboy themed kind of track. Almost got a kind of heavy country feel to it. Flip it over, and the pummeling starts again with Power Supply, the title cut. Then you've got a couple of kind of, uh, it eases up a little bit for Secrets in My Head, and the spine singly time to remember. I mean, Burke Shelley writes some fantastic heavy rock numbers. Some fantastic bluesy rock numbers but he can write a nice kind of introspective kind of almost like prog rock number as well and uh tight remembers one of them and then just when you think the hell's over it comes back with crime against the world which rounds out the album superbly um if you've not heard budgie uh not heard the later budgie i do recommend this album big time um not a weak moment on it uh some nice kind of Terminator budgie uh, cover, um, which I don't know who did it, but uh, because there's no inner sleeve or anything on here, but um, and it's not signed, but um, yeah, it's just one of those albums that every metal fan should at least hear, if not own. Yeah, 1980 budgie power supply, kin brilliant. Well, that's this week's selection over and done with. I hope you've enjoyed. Remember, if you kind of want to agree with me, disagree with me, give me your own personal opinion of any of the albums I've looked at, or recommend an album that I should go and have a listen and check out. Um, I can't guarantee, because at the moment I have to have it on physical copy. If I haven't got a physical copy, I can't do it. Someone asked for some Killing Joke the other week, and uh, I don't possess any physical Killing Joke albums, although I will rectify that at some point and get back to you. But anyway... Um, yeah, comments are down there on uh, YouTube, Finger Dance Night, Mum for the Mother, they are down there, over there on Facebook. Um, yeah, leave a co leave a comment and uh, yeah, like to hear what you think. Um, remember, like and subscribe if you haven't subscribed, so you know when the next one's coming out. And uh, yeah, uh, radio shows are down there and over there as well. <clears throat> Not sure what's happening next week. Only I've copped jury service, so. Uh, time when I should be doing this is probably going to have to be taken up while preparing the radio shows because they would do take priority although I will try and get some kind of video out depending on how the week the next two weeks pans out but there will be something next week regardless so until next week peeps um I love every single last ones of you 
and I'm out of here. Goodbye.